Seconds. I um, played around with this other camera and I actually got it to work, so today it's supposed to have my face on it. <laughs> and then uh, the battery. So, yeah. Now, I'll put it over Music is loud, noted. Oh my god, music is hella loud. Okay. Is that better? <laughs> so loud. <laughs> wow. Yes, okay. It's better on my end also. I was trying to figure out... You did see something about affiliate on Monday. Woot woot. Yeah, so, um, Amelie, today we're going to be doing like some science exploration and stuff. Thank you. Okay, I'm crossing my fingers that this works and that I have the camera set up correctly because now I haven't had a chance to try it. Don't make fun of my face. Okay? No making fun of my face. Um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, so today, Mameli, we're going to be doing some science exploration. Um, we're going to have... Oh, I want to fix something really quick before we really get going. Uh, there'll be a chance for you. Hi, Doc! <laughs> Um, no, no, stop that. Um, so what I'm going to do is really quick, I'm going to go in and I'm going to lower the cost of highlighting your message. Hey, Drago. Yay. I'm so glad you're all here. Um, I'm going to go in, I'm going to lower the cost of highlighting your message. And if you have an actual question that you would like answered or explored today, you will be able to highlight your message, uh, with channel points. But let me do that really quick because I forgot to do it. No, not yet. We'll cuddle later. Yeah, we'll cuddle later. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> dur, 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 dur. Channel points, bits and cheering. Hype train. I can do this. Oh, uh, community. Channel points. Here we go. Yep, that's not what I wanted. Here we go. I can do this. I've only done this like once, so sorry. Bear with me. Um, good. You can kind of see the kitties in the background. Kitties. Hi, kitties. Meow, meow. Daisy, yay! How are you? Thank you for the raid, my friend. Party of eight. Wow. We just jumped. Um, highlight my message. Here we go. We're going to edit this. Oh. The cost for this reward must be at least 10 points. All right. So there we go. Uh, so you guys can highlight your messages now for 10 points. Welcome, Raiders. How was the rest of your Spelunking 2 stream? Did you kill the cat? <laughs> they named their cat Tabby made me feel so nice inside. I never killed a cat. 
Right. The the bomb spell guy. I did welcome you, talk. <laughs> okay, that's abuse of highlighting. <laughs> Actually, it's abuse of cats. Dese. So disappointed. So disappointed, my friend. How could you? <laughs> did you win? Is that just like an, is it an endless game? Is there no end game? I don't know anything at all about Swanking. No, you need to. This is the world's neediest dog. In case anyone was wondering. Right? So needy. I gave you breakfast. What do you want? What more do you want in life? What command doesn't work anymore? <laughs> oh, what command doesn't work, Drago? Okay, are you satisfied? Are you happy with your thank you. Are you happy with your life now? There we go. It does work. You used it. The shadow works. <laughs> you used the shadow, literally. Yeah, everyone else saw it. <laughs> um, so kind of the loose plan um, for today. There is going to be marine biology. That is right, Croc. I'm so glad you're here. Oh, it didn't show it. Okay. No, it showed it for all of us. So you're good. You're absolutely fabulous. Well done, Drago. I appreciate you. I'm glad you could make it. I wasn't sure if you'd be at work. Stay. <laughs> Yay! Luna in chat. Woot woot. Uh, so yeah, the loose plan for today, we're going to be focusing largely on marine biology, unless someone has another question. Um, but kind of wrapped up in that, we're going to be doing some oceanography slash geology. Uh, we're definitely going to look at orcas because it's me. Uh, we're also going to look at shrimp. So I have some cool shrimps. Oh, I think my camera just died. We're about to find out. <laughs> <laughs> it had like zero charge it died so uh here let's do yep camera's dead sorry everyone here's some kittens for you to look at <laughs> take the countdown timer off <laughs> that freeze frame i know right <laughs> um so yeah, we're going to be looking at some shrimp, which I'm also really excited about. Um, and kind of in line with that, we're going to be just like a JSA stream. It's that my, like, my battery in my camera actually died. No Sag here. There's no Sag during Marine Biology Day. No Sag, JSA. No Sag. Um, so I got... Excited is not quite the right word, uh, but I was pretty happy when I found out that I could set up. I have a like a professional photography camera. Um, it's like the consumer series. It's not like a Mark or something, but it's a Canon Rebel uh, T6. And I was like, oh, I can use it as a webcam. So I went through all the trouble of setting it up last night, and then I forgot to charge the battery. <laughs> so that happened. <laughs> um, but yeah, and then we'll explore a little bit of chemistry just as it relates to um, marine biology and the oceans. So yeah, I know. It's <laughs> not always smart. And technically, like, it was fully charged when I put it in, but... Uh, the battery is fully charged when I put it in, but I left it on, like, while I took a shower and got ready. Um, soon in an aquarium. Truth. I don't know why they're asleep. They've been crying all morning. I have, I have fed them and played with them and, yeah, hit it, they say. And, uh, elusive, um, I now have a very tiny wound on my thumb. Oh my gosh. Okay. Nope. <laughs> All right, anyway, uh, so let's kind of get going. So I thought that we would start with a little bit, uh, what is that? Why is that there? Nope, uh, that goes, okay. I thought that we would start with a little bit 
of um, oceanography and it sounds really crazy ignore all the words on this I literally just pulled this slide from the internet I like found what I was looking for and I was like it's fine <laughs> I like my taskbar on top it's I change my computer every time my laptops everything my taskbar is always on top yep <laughs> yep um so it, it sounds kind of funny to start uh, oceanography in space, but that is actually where oceanography and ocean life and basically all of us really start is in space. And so what happens is as the sun uh, hits the surface of the earth, uh, we end up with these cells. And this is going to be a very general overview. Yes, that's true. I did. I saw. We have water on Mars. I'm very excited about that. We can explore that. Remind me later, Croc. <laughs> Move on, Dese. We're talking science today. <laughs> uh, so I, I vaguely remember, like, this has to do with, like, high and low pressure. And what we can look at here is we can see, um, I can't remember which one's lat latitude, longitude, and which one's latitude. Uh, but we have, basically, as we're going up and down, we have zero degrees, which is the equator. It doesn't actually technically fall at the equator, which most people don't know, but it doesn't. Um, but for all intents and purposes for here, it happens at the equator. So we have the equator and we have 30 north, 30 south, 60 north, 60 south, and then um, 90 north and 90 south are polar high and polar low. And then what happens is as the sun comes in, we have these areas of high and low pressure. Um, and we have, so we can see here, these are all called cells. And the winds go in different directions. So from the equator, it goes away from the equator. You can see kind of that these arrows are pointing. And so we have low pressure that rises and then it hits high pressure and it drops again and it creates this cell. Okay. And so these two are Hadley cells, feral cells, and then polar cells, of course, happen at the poles. Well, these have direct effects on the ocean currents. So if we look over here, we can see where it talks about um, horse latitudes uh, and the doldrums. So horse latitudes happen at 30 north and 30 south. The doldrums happen at um, the equator. And what these are is these are areas in between cells. And because they're in between cells, these cells affect the currents. So the, the uh, air and pressure moving across the top of the water around and around is what really creates our currents. And so we can see here that these, how this arrow here, where the air, the air moving across is, that's also the way our ocean currents move. Okay, so we're going to get what are called gyres, and we'll talk a little bit about that here in a second. But we get gyres. I keep wanting to point out the screen, and you guys can't actually see me. But we get gyres here, and we get gyres here, and up here, and all kinds of stuff like that. And gyres are also determined by land shape, which is kind of fascinating. If I'm going too fast, please let me know. I want this to be an overview, so I'm trying not to go too in-depth, but I know that I talk quickly, and I know this stuff. I can still point. Thanks, Daisy. <laughs> <laughs> and so what we have here at the doldrums and the horse latitudes is we have these areas where there's no current. Um, <laughs> there's So there's no current here at the doldrums and there's no current at the equator. Not the equator. The doldrums are the equator. There's no current at the horse latitudes, um, which is, you know, where at least like in English or in America, sometimes you get uh, always such a doldrum or something like that, which is a little bit outdated. Like it's an outdated insult, but it is still an insult. And it just refers to like someone being dull because nothing's happening. And it comes from doldrums where you have this section of ocean along the equator where nothing is happening. There's no ocean current, which for us in the days of um, modern boats and motors and things like that, isn't that big of a deal. You you do use more fuel when you're traveling through there. But back when everyone re relied on um, ship sails to travel, traveling through these areas would have been very, very dangerous. So with that in mind, we're going to do a quick search and we're going to look at Dryer. Did I spell it right? Yes. 
Um, this is a good one. So let's open this. Um, and this is the important part of, is there an actual difference in between north or south of the equator current wise? Yes. Uh, so let's go back to the atmosphere. Ooh, I don't remember what it was called. Here, we can come. Nope, because I closed all the other windows. Let's go to history really quick and see. Structure and motion of the atmosphere. Here we go. Again, come on, Tabitha. Let's see here. Open image in your tab. So if we're looking here, we can see this is the equator. And you can see that these arrows, which indicate air currents, this bottom arrow coincides with this purple arrow here, which is the direction that the ocean is going. Okay, that's the way that the current is flowing. So we can see that currents are flowing towards the equator between 30 north and 30 south. And then as we go lower than 30 south or higher than 30 north, they're starting to flow towards the pole, right here. I don't trust you. I'm not using any of your shortcuts, but thank you, I think. Uh, <laughs> And then as you, as you have the, um, the actual pole, once you hit 60 south or 60 north, then basically your currents are always trying, not trying to connect, but they're, they're generally connecting along the equator and then along 60. So from the poles, they travel, uh, from the north pole, it travels south. From the south pole, it travels north. And then you can just kind of see, and this is also kind of how we get the dryers which if we pop over here, we can see, um, subtropical dryers and associated ocean currents. Yeah. So I don't know the names of all of the associated ocean currents or anything like that. Um, but I do know it's, it's interesting because I don't know if you guys have heard of this cause I know that there are people in here from all over the world. Uh, but here on the West coast and really in, um, the United States, we hear a lot of something that's called the Great Pacific Garbage Patch. And this is a place where trash and plastic and nets and buoys and all kinds of stuff just gathers. Gyres are the reason why that this happens. Okay. So if we're looking here, uh, we can see this is the, the equator, right? And then we can see that this is the current traveling away from the equator equator and then this also has to do with heat so it travels away because of because of airflow and, and air currents but it's also warmest at the equator so it's warm that's what this red probably yep warm current so it's warm it's warm it's warm it's getting further away it's getting colder it's getting colder it's getting colder and then it drop back drops back down and we can see that these circular patterns are really 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 determined by the way the land is and if we look down here at the south it's pretty interesting because if you follow these arrows, there's an area on, um, on, in whatever, the south of the planet where there's no land. And so there's just this ongoing current that just circles the south right around Antarctica, um, which is pretty fascinating, actually. I don't remember all the implications that has. It's been a long time since I've taken the class. Um, but anyway, we have the Great Pacific Garbage Patch, which really happens right here. But the thing is, is that there are garbage patches all over the planet. So, um, you know, this is our great Pacific garbage patch, but there's probably one here. There's one here. There's one here. There's one here. And what happens is this, th these gyres are created by currents, but as you come in, the currents get less and less strong, which is why you see like bigger air. It's almost like to pop topography where you see these areas where there's a lot of space in between and the arrows get longer that's just indicating that you know the current isn't as strong as you move in and this is the center of that gyre and that the center of the gyre is basically still which is why this is where garbage and plastic and things gather which is fascinating and terrible 
all at the same time. Um, but gyres really, it's also really interesting because as you get to the gyre, there's only like a max depth of the ocean. And I don't remember what it is, so I can't say. But there's only like a certain amount of deep that the ocean gets, with the exception of some places such as the Mariana Trench, which is about seven to eight miles deep. And there are these what are known as like ocean deserts. And it's because nothing lives there. And it's because life in the ocean and therefore really life on Earth is dependent on currents for nutrient flow and energy flow and fishing. Can you imagine if you had to go all the way out here to fish? because there was nothing here, um, we would never eat fish again or lobster or shrimp or whatever, whatever your uh, desired uh, oceanic uh, yummy thing. I also want to just take a minute and clarify um, that should not be it. Clarify that we're talking or I am talking specifically about marine environments only. This does not cover um, lakes or rivers or anything like anything like that. This is strictly marine. Um, yeah. I love it. It's great. It's fantastic. It, it explains so much. Uh, it also explains why um, there's so much life like along the coast and stuff because that's where the biggest currents are is right along the coast. And oceanography is a really, it's a super interesting subject. It's one of those classes where I took and I was like, oh, I could totally get into this. I could totally see myself doing this because a lot of it, it's really a geology. Um, I, I think of oceanography in the sense of marine biology because that's where my, my brain and my heart is, but it's really a geological subject because it's about land formation and how things are created. There's a whole uh, section of oceanography that deals with uh, tectonic plates um, and earthquakes and how that creates tsunamis and max wave uh, height and length and you know what's there's there's uh we we think of like the seven seas but really sea refers to a specific type of wave uh it's very fascinating and i remember um finding out that like there is a max wave height and i was kind of disappointed because you see those like end of the world movies and it's you know you have these like 500 foot waves and they just come crashing down and everybody dies. Not that I want that to actually happen, but when I learned that that is actually according to the laws of physics impossible, a little bit disappointing. Um, I think that the max height for a wave is like 75 feet or something like that. Going away waves. <laughs> How is everybody doing? Are we hanging in? I feel like right now this is a lecture and I want it. I want to make sure that we're, um, interacting and if we have questions we can we can ask questions and things like that. I don't want anyone to be too intimidated to pop their nose in. Absolutely talk. I have no idea what's going on when I'm listening, fair enough. Absolutely. Yeah, so um it's interesting that you bring that up because continental drift is a thing. Uh and if we oh I don't know if I can find an image Continental shelf. I don't know if I can find um, like an overall image, but continental drift is a thing. It's happening. It's millimeters a year, really. Um, that's not accurate. This isn't too bad. Let's open this up. Sorry. No, you're fine. I'm don't want to disturb you. Oh, okay. Uh, he's about to put some music on, I think. Uh, so if we... Whoa. It gets bigger? I, get, I need it smaller. <laughs> uh, global distribution of outer continental shelf. So when we look at continental drift, um, we can also look at continental uh, like oceanic shelves. And that will, to a certain extent, tell us which way... This is a terrible... This is terrible. I'm looking at it now, and it's not good. Um... It'll tell us which way we're drifting, essentially. And I don't remember which one it is. I want to say that 
um, the west coast of pretty much any continent has a larger continental shelf, which indicates that we are drifting east. And there's a really interesting thing about how um, tsunamis and islands and stuff are formed. Um, so if we look at Hawaii, uh, Hawaii map, uh, sure. Ah, I clicked on that. It's gonna, that's bad. Uh, I mean, any one of these would be fine here. Let's do this one. I'm gonna have so many windows open, I'm not gonna know what to do here in a minute. Here we go. So if we look at a map of Hawaii, which is um, an island chain in the United States. <laughs> Continental shelves, yeah. Absolutely, continental shelves. <laughs> so we look at Hawaii, which is an island chain um, slash state that is part of the United States of America. Uh, it's it's interesting because Hawaii is what's considered like volcanic islands. And so we see like little ones here and like this. And so we can actually trace the um, movement of... Uh, the the crust, the crust of the earth. Because really what, what and I'm sure that you know this talk, but really what, what you're talking about talk is the movement of the crust of the earth in regards to floating over like the magma base, which is inside of the core. And so if we look at this, we can see like there's a little island here and then this one's a little bit bigger and then this one's a little bit bigger than that. And then this one's kind of a little bit bigger and then we have these little ones. And so the way that something like this is formed especially when it's like almost a straight line is that for instance like this would have, would have been formed first or more recently i don't remember i don't remember which way it goes but essentially like an island would be formed and then the shelf that's lying over the core of the earth which is really only it's only like five miles thick or something like that and so no it's thicker than that anyway it's not very thick in regards to the size of the actual earth. And so as that shelf moves, say it started here, this was the first island, then the next one would be this island would be formed when it came to its next resting place. And then this one at its next resting place. And then this one at its next resting place, um, which is really, really fascinating. Uh, the earth is constantly moving. It's, and here's another kind of cool fact is that the Earth's magnetic poles, one, many people know this, but in case you don't, um, the magnetic poles are not exactly like straight north and straight south. They are a little bit off. Also, they switch occasionally, which they can see in certain um, sediment samples that have been taken from the ocean floor. I don't know what that looks like. I don't remember. But <laughs> you certainly can. Um, another pretty cool thing is that, um, and this isn't necessarily geology slash, oh wait, okay. So technically speaking, Hawaii could get another island after a thousand years. I think that it would take longer than a thousand years, but yes, absolutely. That is exactly correct. Yep. Um, and I mean, that really goes for any, any island chain. Uh, I know that we're talking and looking at Hawaii, but yes, pretty much any island chain, uh, this is something that could happen for sure. And it does happen all around the world. I want to say there are other island chains that we learned about that I don't, I just don't remember. And so I can't even look them up. I have my oceanography book. I kind of um, grabbed it and popped it open, but we didn't actually use the book in my class. <laughs> he had a bunch of like handouts and materials that we used um, because he is like an actual geologist and has published papers and things like that. His name is Dr. Ralph Hitz. Um, and he does for certain some oceanography work. So, uh, oceanography was a really great class. Uh, I had to take it in conjunction with a course on ocean plastics. So it was a two part class. Uh, one part of it was oceanography, which is this. We also, I mean, we talked about so many different things. So one of the other units that we went over was chemical composition of ocean water, 
which is really, really, uh, for me, who really loves chemistry as well as biology, it was really fascinating. Uh, the ocean, as salty as it is, it's only like 3.3% salt. So technically, these uh, stupid salted licorice um, are... <laughs> oh, yay! Thanks for the follow, Your Honor. <laughs> um so much yay and katie win i kate win kate win uh, i saw that you followed too <laughs> when i wasn't live uh so these salty licorice drops are uh let me see oh wait, wait, wait. they're 9.9 percent .9 salt so the salty licorice drops are actually more salty than the ocean the ocean is 3% salt. Um, that salt is not just sodium chloride. It, it, it does contain sodium chloride. All of the salt that will ever like hit your table or anything like that, that comes from the ocean. Um, there are all kinds of really cool things that are created from ocean salt. Uh, and that salt is mined and then it makes its way to your table. It's actually really incredible that it's as cheap as it is at least here, uh, for all the work that goes into mining salt. Uh, but salt chemically really refers to um, most ionic compounds or a compound that is composed of a metal and a non-metal. Oh, I don't know why it held your message. <laughs> I don't know the answer to that. I don't know the answer to that, Doc. <laughs> Strangely enough, welcome has not been uh, a <laughs> topic that I've covered in school yet. Uh, um, and so you have what are called um, like ocean, ocean sinks and ocean sources. So an ocean source would be something that provides the salt or is a is a source of the salt and then you have a sink which is how something gets removed from the ocean so at any given time there's only a certain percentage of specific ionic compounds or specific salts within the ocean because they're being sourced into and removed from from things like underwater vents um and there's a really interesting uh, composition. I'm not going to take the time to look it up. It would take me forever to find it in the book. But it's there's an interesting composition of salts within the ocean. And it is primarily sodium chloride, but it's not all sodium chloride. Water itself is a pretty interesting compound. Um, it's, as far as I know, asterisk attached, as far as I know, it is the only compound that expands when it uh, transfers from a liquid to a solid form. So typically what happens with matter is you have uh, three primary states. There are a couple of other like additional states, but there are three primary states, which most people know about solid, liquid, and gas. And of course, like the oxygen and nitrogen that we breathe is the gas form. We all know what liquids are. And then we all generally know what solids are, like the desk and the microphone and my, the ice and my cup, all solids. So most substances, when they go through those stages, when you go from a solid to a liquid, you get, um, less condensed so there is not more of you but you take up more space as you go from a solid to liquid and then when you go from a liquid to a gas you take up even more space now there are other constraints within that that have to do with the size of containers and how just like definitions of what those things are water is one of the only things on the planet uh, or that we have found not not even necessarily on this planet but even uh in in our so farly discovered universe that expands when it goes so it goes from a gas to a liquid and becomes more condensed but when it goes from a liquid to a solid it becomes less condensed which has to do with the arrangement of uh, water molecules in the solid which is largely due to hydrogen bonding and I feel like that might be getting into something that we don't necessarily want to talk about today um, but it's very important in the terms of things like icebergs um, and how water is stored naturally, I guess you could say. So the water rises because ice caps melt. Yep. Exactly. Yep, yep, yep. 
Here's your chance, Stacey. Yep, 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 yep. <laughs> I think we may have lost him. <laughs> uh, oh, I don't have a BTTV emote thingy on my, oh, well, you know, life is sad. Um, which is also why <laughs> my brain, <laughs> water seems really sus right now. Well, it's, it's, all of these unique properties of water are what make finding water on other planets so important. Um, the way that water uh, uh, dissociates and binds with other molecules, the things that it does for biological systems, uh, the just general physical and chemical properties that it has, those are the reasons why water is so important to find on places like Mars because it's very unlikely to find life without water. Um, it's also, uh, chemically speaking, breaking away from water just a little bit. Um, but one of the reasons, you know, people talk about uh, finding the blueprints of life on other planets. And what they're looking for is actually organic compounds and or we're about to break into something a, a little slash a lot above what I know. I know some very basic so that's what I can share with you. It gets really complicated after that. I have not taken organic chemistry. But when we're talking about life on other planets and this is a really fascinating subject and we start talking about organic compounds, really the key ingredient is carbon, which we take for granted, I think, because it's literally everywhere. <laughs> carbon is in almost everything and it's because we have so many organic compounds here on earth and it's really um the backbone of organic compounds and so the likelihood of finding life someplace that does not have carbon it would change absolutely everything that we know about science really if we were to find life somewhere that that did not contain carbon um and I would, I would argue that carbon might even be more important than oxygen, uh, but I don't know the answer to that. That's, that's again, a little bit above my knowledge base. So how are we doing? How are we doing chat? Are we having fun? Are y'all as excited as I am? We're almost an hour in already and we've only talked about geology. I'm I'm not sending that through day say. Sorry, bud. <laughs> Okay. I'm thinking that we're okay. Um, so now I want to talk a little bit about, uh, it's both biological oceanography and marine biology. It's kind of the cross between the two. And, and it's also chemistry. <laughs> so we've talked a little bit about uh, properties of water. We've talked a little bit about building blocks of life. Uh, let's look at food chains um, a little bit. A lot of, or from what I've seen, most biological term for this is actually uh, trophic systems. And trophic system is really, it's really just the food chain. When you're looking at trophics, you're looking at the food chain. And the food chain is all about energy transfer. It's really fascinating the fact, um, I'm going to pull up. Have anything that really talks about this? Uh, I don't know. Let's just do a quick Google search for trophic level pyramid. Let's see what that does. Um, oh, here we go. This one's even a marine, a marine uh, pyramid. Oh my God, it's very tiny. Um, Oh, it's from National Geographic, though. Okay. Let's... Ugh, can you guys kind of see that? <laughs> uh, 
Um, I don't know if you click it first before open in tab. Click it first. Okay. I mean, I can do that. Oh, I see what you're saying. Hey! Uh, okay, awesome. Um, so this is perfect, because this is exactly what I wanted to talk about. So we talked about gyres, and we talked about how important currents are. So we're going to move from that to talking about plankton. So plankton is super, super important when we are talking about food webs. And I'm not just talking about any food web. I'm talking about all food webs, okay? Our food web, marine food webs, the food web of the bear that lives in the forest down the street, plankton are super important. Plankton actually refers uh, to an organism that... Plankton is not the carbon. No, plankton and carbon are different. So plankton are multicellular organisms um, and cells are made up of hundreds of thousands of different kinds of atoms. So this is very different. Um, but plankton refers to an organism that basically has to go wherever the current says. And when we talk about plankton, a lot of times we're talking about very small organisms, but they're also very large plankton. So there's a really, really big fish I want to say it's the Mori Mori. Don't quote me on that. But there is a really big fish that is actually a type of plankton because it cannot um, go somewhere that the current doesn't take it. It has to go with the current. Now, within that, I mean, they can move a little bit. It's not like they're paralyzed or anything. They just don't have the strength or the ability to go where a current doesn't take them, which is, again, why the currents are so important and where they happen is so important. So at the very, very bottom of our food, any food chain, we have what are called primary producers. Basically plants. Plants are primary producers. What they do is they take light and they turn light into energy and then they take that energy and turn it into sugar, which allows them to grow. And then when the next uh, organism up on the trophic level, first order consumers, when those eat primary producers, they get that energy. So, oh, I didn't know that was a creature. That makes sense. Hmm. Okay. Anyway, not, not the point. Um, so phytoplankton are primary producers. Not only are they primary producers, but they're also one of the primary oxygenators of the planet. So when we're talking about, I don't know if you guys can hear me. I'm like talking with my hands, doing the teacher thing. Hi, Mew Mew. Oh, it does feel good. Yeah. Um, but when we're talking about phytoplankton, we're talking about primary oxygen producers. SpongeBob vibes. Yeah, that's fair. <laughs> um, so a lot of people think that, and this, I mean, we should not be doing deforestation. I know I joke about it when I play a subtech with they say, but we really shouldn't joke about deforestation. Um, and things like that but this percentage is given to you with an asterisk attached because I don't remember the exact percent and I couldn't find it this morning phytoplankton produce like 40 percent of the world's oxygen so as we destroy our oceans with things like plastic and trash and global warming we're destroying phytoplankton and we're destroying oxygen resources which is super bad let's not even talk about what it's doing to the trophic system I would like to continue breathing. Don't know how you feel about it. But anyway, at the bottom, we have we have phytoplankton, seagrass, algae, things like that. And then we talk, start talking about first order consumers. Now, first order consumers, we come back to plankton. We have zooplankton. So phytoplankton are the plant plankton. They live within, I want to say it's called the photosphere. That could be wrong also. Again, it's been a little while. But basically, it's the light zone. The litmus zone. That's what it is. The litmus zone of um, the ocean. It's any area of the ocean that light can penetrate. So when we start getting really deep, like into, for example, the Mariana Trench, we lose light. We lose phytoplankton. Um, there are other systems. There are other ways that those energy transfers happen. But it's not directly from phytoplankton in the sense that those consumers are eating phytoplankton they're probably eating something that ate something that ate phytoplankton 
So once we get over, so first order consumers eat primary producers. So they are the direct line. From there, we have intermediate predators or secondary consumers, which eat the things that eat the phytoplankton <laughs> or eat the things that eat the plant. And then we have top predators. This is where we get into our apexes. So here we can see uh, bluefish tunas, gray reef sharks. If we wanted to talk a little bit about terrestrial animals, we also have bears, humans, uh, wolves, um, aquatic, we have orcas and dolphins are all top predators and apexes and those eat down. So you'll see here that we have 1000 pounds, 100 pounds, 10 pounds, one pound. This is important because this is where we kind of circle back and we hit energy transfer. Remember when I said that energy transfer is really everything and we have energy that goes into the phytoplankton from the light and then they turn it into sugar and blah, 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 blah. So what this is saying is that it takes a thousand pounds of primary producer to get, let's say this is 1000 units of energy per one unit of energy produced in a secondary or a, uh, uh, shit, primary consumer. Then it takes a hundred pounds or a hundred units of energy from a primary consumer to fuel one, one piece of energy or one pound of energy to a, um, secondary consumer or an intermediate predator in this case on this one and then it takes 10 pounds of this or 10 energy of this for one pound of this or one energy of this so we can see we have lost more than 90 percent of the energy as we go up and this is really important because this is why we only have as many apexes as we do or as only as many top predators as we do this is why fish are you know there's 80,000 fish or, you know, uh, a blue whale can eat krill because there's so many krill because they're krill or zooplankton. And, you know, we have this really big top predator that acts, well, predator, quote unquote, top consumer, uh, that actually acts as an intermediate predator because it's eating the zooplankton. Um, but it has to eat so many of them. But there are hundreds and millions and billions of krill for every one um, baleen whale, which is going to include gray whales, uh, blue whales, and things like that. Energy transfer. Ooh. Um, energy transfer sharing uh, controls pretty much everything. So right now we're talking about consumers and things that eat other things and trophic systems. But if we even go down, stop that don't hiss at me uh if we even go down uh to the atomic level so many things are controlled by the transfer of electrons or the transfer of energy um that really everything everything is energy this this whole planet this whole universe this whole everything it's all energy which is pretty cool how are we doing chat do you have questions everyone's so quiet i'm worried that i've lost you all <laughs> Smiley face from Daisy. Okay. <laughs> and if you need clarification, it's okay to ask. It is absolutely okay to ask. This is my passion. I want to share it with you. You guys said that you wanted to see it as a stream, <laughs> as an affiliate uh, celebration stream. So yay, here we are. <sighs> Yeah, that's a really interesting. So the, the question for the bod, uh, talk asks, okay, so controversial, isn't it bad if we start messing with the top predators, like breeding more because they die out, you know, quote unquote, die out, uh, go extinct, whatever. Um, I don't know that I know enough to make a truly good case either way. I am going to share my opinion. And my opinion is, I don't know. <laughs> Um, which is, I, I feel like it could, it could be fought either way. Um, it's funny because I did some research and we're going to talk a little bit about this a little bit later, but I did some research with one of the, 
um, top invasive species marine biologists, at least in the country. Because technically speaking, if we breed more predators, we fuck up the balance, right? Well, here's the thing, and that is that we've already fucked up the balance. Um, with the amount of factory farms and clearing land uh, for... So, I mean, we could just talk about cows. If we talk about cows, a lot of cows are fed uh, a corn-based diet. And so, <laughs> yeah, that's... that's Fairly true, they say. Um, so a lot of cows, and this is just something that I kind of know about, so this is what I'm going to look at. A lot of cows are fed a corn-based diet. Well, that means that where we might generally have more diversity in crops, we don't because a lot of farms have been taken over to farm corn to feed cows to feed the beef industry. And if we look at cows, cows are really first order consumers if we're looking at this list because a lot of times they eat grains and grass and all of the things that we would consider to be primary producers. So therefore they would be considered a primary consumer. <clears throat> but we take that beef and we, as creatures who are typically omnivores, um, eat a lot of it, which might probably bump us up to intermediate predators or even sometimes top predators. But also we feed that, like if we, for example, I'm trying to, I'm trying to organize my thoughts well, and I don't know that I'm doing a good job. But for example, say we have a breeding program for an endangered species of tiger at a zoo. And in general, I'm like, yay, let's save the endangered species. But we have a breeding program, but those animals always stay in the zoo. So what we're probably looking at is that they're being fed a significant amount of beef. So yeah, we're kind of fucking it up by trying to protect these animals. And realistically, if we look, so we also save the sea by eating so much fish and thus stop the pyramid growing too much. So we also save the sea I do like beef. <laughs> I like beef too. I love hamburgers. Like, and it's like, I don't think there's anything wrong with eating a hamburger. And I'm going to be honest, like I don't do the things that I probably should do to make sure that I'm ethically eating beef. But if we look at pollution and things like that, most of the pollution is coming from corporations. And I can do my best as an individual, but I'm not going to make a dent. What we really need is more legislation. And I don't know if it's global, global, ugh, global or not. You guys would know better about your own home, home countries and what things like that look like. But I know here in the States, we need more legislation that really protects the planet. Um, and instead, and this is going to be a slightly political and I'm not, I'm not going to stick on it very long because that's not what this is supposed to be. But instead we have, um, large lobbyists for industries that do a lot of polluting, who have a lot of money, who can buy politicians, who will sign deals that will protect their financial gains as opposed to protecting the planet. And it's a very short-sighted thing because what's going to happen is we're going to tank this planet. If we're lucky, we might find someplace else to go. But if we're not, all of our kids are fucked. <laughs> like, that's just kind of, that's kind of the world that we're living in. Um, okay, D done with that. Um, I mean, as humans, we like to think... And I don't know if this is really going to answer your question, Talk. But as humans, we like to think that we are not part of the systems that we're living in. We like to think that we are apart from them, especially because we have the ability to study them. But the truth is, is we are a part of them. We are a part of every system on this planet. If I never go to Australia, I'm still a part of that system by being a human, especially a human in a global economy and in a global world where everything is so connected. And you're included, they say, yay! <laughs> um, give me two seconds, you guys. I'm going to plug the... Uh, I'm doing a lot of talking and not as much on the screen as I thought, so I'm going to plug this battery in and see if I can get it charged up. I'll be right back.
<laughs> I think that there's also something to say about the fact that, um, you know, as we are in a place uh, in our humanity, evolution, whatever you want to call it, where we feel like we sh we are we are stewards and we are very powerful and we think that we need to save everything i don't know that that's necessarily true i think that we need to protect systems uh for example phytoplankton as an overall system um but realistically extinction is a perfectly natural thing to happen um extinction events events not events as in like big global events but extinction events are more common um now that we have really got into abusing our planet than they used to be but i mean look at the dinosaurs and there's there's entire um i'd have to pull up like the the we can look at it let's see um evolutionary Periods and eras. Uh, yeah. Let's take that down. I mean, look. Look at all of the eras, the eons, the periods, the epochs that we've been through. Um, and think about all of the things. I mean, even if we just go here. Like, this is where the Mesozoic is really where we're talking about dinosaurs. Ev not everything, but realistically, hey, Nilo, but realistically, every, you know, almost everything that lived during this time is gone. Extinction is a perfectly natural thing. The problem is human assisted extinction. Do I think that we need to intervene every time? No. Do I think that we need to intervene when we're the problem? Yeah, that's probably not bad. No, you don't. <laughs> Shush you. <laughs> you do not want to get extinct. Um, yeah. So, I mean, this, you know, this is, this is religion aside. This is just science. I know that there are probably a variety of different views uh, in chat lurking, watching the VOD, and that's fine. Um, oh, I just realized that that bottom bar is covering that there we go um and that's totally fine you are welcome to believe whatever you believe i am a scientist who is also an atheist these are the things that i believe it's not against you um yeah so i mean there's there's a lot of things that have already gone extinct uh i also struggle a little bit when we start talking about introduce and um i feel like introduce and invasive species can be considered two different things so when we're talking about introduced species, we're talking about uh, like cats to North America. <laughs> um, let's get extincted on. All right, all right. Only positive thoughts in chat today. Only positive thoughts. We're doing science, yo. <laughs> um, so yeah, when we're talking to introduce. Oh, okay. So before I continue with certain questions, can I call evolution? better than mother nature i i would say that evolution is a part of mother nature wait okay i'm waiting to talk uh nilo i mean the worst part of dying would be friends and family feel bad so nilo i know or i'm assuming um, like, I, I understand what you're saying and I understand that you are likely being sarcastic, uh, but let's not talk about that today. Um, please. Okay, talk. Still waiting. You mistyped. Okay, yes. Evolution is mother nature. Yeah, I mean, when you look at mother nature as bigger than just this planet, if you look at Mother Nature as an entire solar system universe and multi-universes of matter interacting with each other, yeah. Yeah, I would say evolution is part of Mother Nature. Um, 
I would say that extinction is part of Mother Nature. I think that all of those are natural. I think that they all happen. I think that they all continue to happen. The thing is, is that... Stop pausing chat. Okay. Uh, the thing is, is that people want evolution to be fast. And they think that evolution is fast. And they think that evolution and adaptation are the same thing. And they're not. Uh, adaptation tends to happen over shorter periods of time to help a species survive. Whereas evolution is smaller changes... Um, ignited by genetic mutation that happens over a long time uh, that is increased by uh, planetary events, sexual selection, all kinds of things. And it's interesting because when we we talk about this, this is a really interesting topic to me. And I also consider like, you want to talk about all the different careers that I've considered. Here's one that was kind of fun, which is um, like evolutionary genetic biology. And when we talk about Darwin's theory of survival of the fittest, it's a lot of times misconstrued or misunderstood uh, because people think that when we talk about survival of the fittest, we're talking about survival of the strongest. And that is not true. We are talking about survival of the fittest in the sense of survival of the organism that is most fit for its environment. And that's when we start breaking down into things like niches or niches, depending on where you're from. And what happens is we end up with a variety of organisms that are fit for their environment in different ways, which is how we get biological diversity, is because these 10 species all exist in this one forest because they fulfill different uh, niches or different aspects of nature so they can coexist because they're not all competing for the same resources. I watched a YouTube video um, last night while I was trying to set up for the stream and stuff. And the video was honestly mostly boring. But there was an interesting thing. They were talking about the precursor to the crocodile or one of the precursors to the crocodile. And it was, I don't remember what it was called, but it was very, very large, very, very sharp teeth. Um, really was an ugly crocodile. That's what it looked like. And of course everything was CGI, so maybe that's why it was ugly. But in any case, uh, the the theory is, is that um, ultimate tier. <laughs> Crocodile's ultimate tier. Crocodiles are pretty awesome. I miss Steve Irwin. That's all I got. Uh, ooh, I see a buffering thing. I hope I'm still connected. Okay, we're good. Um, the thing about this prehistoric crocodile is that it was too good at what it did. So the theory behind why this crocodile went extinct has nothing to do with extraplanetary events or asteroids or global warming or ice ages or anything like that. It was such a good hunter that it drove itself extinct. Um... <laughs> It, it literally hunted all of its prey until there was nothing left for it to eat and it starved and went extinct. So talking about mother nature taking things back can involve extinction in certain area systems in order to save others. Humans thinking we are not part of mother nature's action is small brain, in my opinion. Okay, let me read that one more time. I think it's it's less about saving other systems because let's let's be honest I love mother nature I'm a biologist at heart uh, if I wasn't going for marine biology I would I would be doing some some other kind of biology um, and mother nature is a heartless bitch like she doesn't care let's talk about her as if she is a person uh, she just doesn't care um, there are things that are gonna happen it's less about yeah, it's less about saving other systems or species and more about certain things happen. And it's up to those systems or species to either adapt and evolve or die. Yeah. And yes, thinking, humans thinking a small, we're not part of mother nature, a small brain. Yeah. We like to think of ourselves as outside of it. And I think that science uh, is a little bit to blame for that. I don't know if I could say totally to blame for that. Um, but I think that it's definitely a little bit to blame for it. And it comes down from the fact that as scientists, especially when we're talking um, about um, like behaviorists or things like that, where literally all we can do is observe. Like we don't 
there's experiments and we set up experiments, but most of what we do is observing is that we try to remove ourselves from those situations as much as possible so that we're getting data as accurately as possible for what would happen if we weren't there. And it, it kind of comes down. There's, um, it's a theory in chemistry and I can't remember what it's called. Okay, I kind of remember. So it has to do with subatomic particles and electrons. And we're not going to break down into that too much because that's not the point. But um, light particles and atoms have what's called a uh, photon uh, particle, particle wave duality. Thank you. Forgive me a second, geez. So they have a particle wave duality where they can behave like waves, but they can also behave like particles. So essentially, when we talk about waves, we're talking about photon packets. So they can behave like these photon packets, or they can behave like individual things. And by simply observing them, we erase their ability to do one of those things. And it's fascinating. I don't remember what what it's actually called. Um, but I would encourage you, let's, let's see if we can find it really quick. Um, photon wave particle duality. Uh, wave particle duality. Here we go. This is Wikipedia, but it's fine. Okay. Quantum mechanics that every particle of quantum entity may be described as either a particle or wave. It expresses the inability of the classical concepts particle wave to fully describe the behavior of quantum scale objects. I knew it was an Einstein thing. Um, Max Planck, Albert Einstein, Broglie, Compton, Niels Bohr. Maybe this isn't it. Oh wait, maybe it is. Regarded the duality paradox as fundamental or metaphysical fact of nature. A given kind of quantum object will exhibit sometimes waves, sometimes particle character in respectively different physical settings. He saw such dualities one aspect of the concept complementary. Bohr regarded renunciation of the cause-effect relationship or complementary of the space-time picture. Okay, this is above my head. Um, here it is. Heisenberg's uncertainty principle is what I was looking for. So Heisenberg originally explained this as a consequence, the process of measuring, measuring position accurately. Okay, it's about position, not about um, wave particle duality. Uh, measuring position accurately would disturb momentum and vice versa, offering an example that depended uh, crucially on the de Broglie hypothesis. The thought is now, however, that this only partially explains the phenomenon, but that the uncertainty also exists in the particle itself, even before the measurement is made. Uh, so in layman's terms, um, basically by trying to measure this thing, you are affecting it and therefore your measurement will never be totally accurate. Um, that was fun. Thanks guys. <laughs> It absolutely would. And that that's kind of the point that I've been trying to make is that um, this uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle doesn't just apply to this particle wave duality uh, and measurement, but it applies to everything. So simply by observing, you know, people really hail, and I don't know enough about her. I, I would also hail her as an amazing scientist. Uh, but Jane Goodall, who is still alive, which I didn't know. <laughs> uh, but Jane Goodall is still alive. Jane Goodall has done amazing work uh, with apes. And I want to say gorillas. Let's look it up. Um, yep, she's a primatologist. Uh, chimps. She did work with chimps. Um, Jay Goodall did amazing work with chimps. Name checks out. <laughs> um, where she went and she studied them. Now, 
I mean, I don't think that any results that she got aren't good. Otherwise, why would we ever do science? But there has to be consideration for the fact that just her being there would have likely changed the behavior of the chimp she was studying. And this this becomes really important as we start to talk about um, observing natural systems and observing organism behavior, which is really my passion. I love behavioral science. Um, I started, uh, I've always loved orcas or killer whales um, since I was really, really little. I got really involved in behavioral science actually when I started working uh, at my first dog kennel. I worked for a year in the boarding department with dogs and cats. And then I worked for do two years, do I worked for two years. I worked for two years in the doggy daycare area. I learned so much about behavior and behavioral science. So I hated that place of employment. <laughs> it was awful. But I will say one of the best things they ever did was they brought in a state certified uh, canine behaviorist. And the interesting thing about it is that this the behavior is different, but the techniques for studying behavior and for influencing behavior are the same. If you look at dogs, if you look at cats, if you look at dolphins. So for example, Dese, I know you and Swiss said that you clicker train Luna to sit for cookies and pets and all kinds of things like that. Now a dolphin can't sit. It doesn't a dolphin can't sit. But the same principles that go into training Luna to sit for a cookie are the same principles that go into training a dolphin to detect mines on the ocean floor or to do a jump or a killer whale to splash an audience at SeaWorld. It's the same principles that are used. It's positive reinforcement conditioning, which scientifically is called operant conditioning, with the idea being that the operator is actually the organism that you're training and they get to decide um, when you're done <laughs> and when you're not done and whether they're going to continue. There are other principles involved in that. Um, but yeah, so that, I mean, I feel like this is a great jumping place where we get to kind of talk about uh, behavior, but I do want to pause and make sure that we don't have any questions about anything that we've been over so far. Um, oh, here we go. There is a philosophical thought experiment that somewhat uses the Heisenberg way of thinking. I don't know why we don't have yep. I'm going to look into that. I know it's weird. Um, so talk, I think what you're thinking about is Schrodinger's cat. Wait, how did you do that? Oh, yep, puh, puh. You have to put two P's. Yep, puh, puh. <laughs> um, but talk, yeah, I think what you're thinking of is the philosophical thought experiment where we start talking about uh, yeah, the tree in the forest. Um, Schrodinger's cat, uh, yes, smiley face. Schrodinger's cat uh, is actually, and this is really fascinating when I first discovered it. <laughs> so sad. <laughs> uh, Schrodinger's cat is actually chemistry. Um, uh, chemistry thought process. It's been uh, adapted and stolen for philosophical thought experiments. Um, but it, it, it did start. Um, Schrodinger is actually a chemist. Uh, so a lot of his things started out as uh, chemistry um, thought experiments. But it's, it's kind of an... It's interesting because I remember learning about the philosophical thought experiment. Uh, <laughs> I mean, you know, stupid. Um... Schrodinger's, Schrodinger's cat is interesting. I remember hearing about it philosophically and I kind of understand it philosophically, but I was like, just shake the box a little. Like the cat is either going to flop or like it's going to try and stay upright. Not the point. <laughs> um, but Schrodinger's, uh, Schrodinger's cat is also a chemistry uh, thought experiment that is meant to talk about electrons there's electron probability maps and so just shake it yeah exactly or i mean you could throw a bomb at it and then just know right they say you're familiar with that 
<laughs> we have talked about this. I feel like we have talked about this. Yeah, where we start talking about probability maps for electron, uh, for electrons around um, an atomic nucleus. And actually, that reminds me, I wanted to show you guys, because this is one of my favorite things about chemistry. Um, uh, let's see if we can find, these are simplified versions. Electron shell 3D. Let's try. Uh, look at this one. That's fine. Um, so electron shells are really interesting uh, because of the way that they operate. So they can be looked at on like an X, Y, Z axis, which is what these are. So each one of these like balloons uh, represents an area of probability for an electron to exist or an area of probability uh, for an electron to occupy. And so this isn't even all of them, uh, but it's really fascinating because if you put like this is one and then this is one and then this is one, um, and if you put them all together, you get what we, you get a shape that's kind of round. So even though electron shells aren't technically round, except for the first one, uh, the S orbital is round, um, which is, I believe what this represents. I don't, I don't remember enough. Um, so even though we think of atoms as tiny little round things, they're not actually round, uh, which is kind of fascinating. I hope you guys are having fun. I'm really enjoying this. I love science. Science is blessed. Um, so if we wanted to take a look, uh, electron shell probability. Diagram. Here we go. This is a really good one. Oh, good. Um, so this is like a, I'm going to say it's a Schrodinger diagram. That's probably not technically accurate, uh, but this is an electron probability diagram. And what, what it is, is they have put a dot everywhere that it, that an electron might occur. And so we can see here that there is a huge concentration right here in the center. This tells me that this is what's called an S orbital or the first orbital shell um, that an electron might occupy, which is, it's actually the only one that's round. Um, and electrons have all kinds of crazy ass properties, uh, which is pretty cool. They can like teleport and things like that. All the rules fly out the window when we start getting into subatomics. I, uh, I had a professor. You will. So I know that you, you, <laughs> you guys laugh and you call me granny. Um, but the, I mean, there's something to be said for the fact that like, I am a little bit older and that's okay. And I have found things, um, that I really enjoy and that I'm really passionate about. And that I've had an opportunity to learn about. And you have plenty of time to do that. I still have plenty of time to do that. Um, <laughs> you know, it's fine. <laughs> so. <clears throat> All right. Who wants to talk about Orcus? <laughs> um, so let's go ahead. We're going to do a little bit of a transition. And we are actually going to talk about Orcas. Um, and we're going to do it by searching for Killer Whale. I'm a little worried that Killer Queen showed up. Um, oh, look. Oh, it's a little baby albino. Time. We are going extinct. Not big fish. So not big fish. In fact, talk. 
I'm kind of glad that you said that because there was something I wanted to talk about that I almost forgot. Um, and it kind of circles back a little bit to when we were talking about evolution and the different time periods. So I didn't know this until fairly recently, um, probably within the last year or so when I took my evolutionary biology class and when we're talking about evolution, we're talking about like the primordial swamp, which is when everything was basically fire and water. And then, you know, we start to see life and then that life crawls out onto land. And there are two different kinds of fins or propelling fins, I guess you could say flippers on sea creatures. So, um, let's see, Oh my gosh, we have to talk about sea snails. Not sea snails, sea slugs. Uh, sea fin. Nope. Nope. Sea flipper? Nope. Let's do shark tail. There we go. Okay, so when we're looking at shark tails, <laughs> that makes sense that that popped up. Um... This is in another language. I don't know if any of y'all can read it. Yeah, sterile. Okay, stop, click, unclick. Uh, so when we're looking at shark fins, and it doesn't matter which shark fin we're looking at, uh, the shark fin is a vertical fin, and it's the same way with most fish, right? So it goes up and down like this, and they propel themselves by swinging that tail side to side. Well, if we look at whale tails, oh, Jesus, what is happening? Why? <laughs> what have I stumbled across? <laughs> um, I mean, here, that's fine. Um, or even here. <laughs> if we look at the propelling tail or the whale tail um, of really any whale, which would also be a mammal, um, they're horizontal, right? So they go up and down in order to propel, propel, propel the whale forward. And that's because these things happened. <laughs> They say that was my selfie. They said it wouldn't be sent or shown to anyone. Um, that's because these these two things happen at different evolutionary times. So when we first have um, sea creatures with fins, they all look like sharks. <laughs> uh, they were all um, vertical or that up and down and went side to side to prop propel themselves forward. And then we see evolutionary evolutionarily where we have creatures crawl out of the ocean and start living on land well at some point they got tired of that it was awful can confirm and they decided to go back to the ocean that's how we end up with the whale tail is when they evolved to return to the ocean um they evolved differently than before they ever went out on the land. So you can kind of tell evolutionarily uh, where a sea creature falls and how long it's been in the ocean. Um, not like actual time for that particular creature, but for that particular uh, species or branch of the evolutionary tree uh, by how the whale or the, the fin, this tail fin um, lays, which is pretty interesting. Also interesting, um, I I always thought that a man like they teach it they teach you when you're a kid or at least they do here in the states that a mammal is warm blooded and everything else is cold blooded, which actually is not true, not scientifically speaking. So mammals scientifically are animals that grow hair, <laughs> um, and I think produce milk. I think that those are the two qualifications for a mammal is that it has to grow hair. And it has to produce milk, which I started wondering about because sea creatures don't typically have hair. Have you ever seen a mane on a dolphin? No. <laughs> but it turns out when they're when they're little and when they're still in development and they're gestating, they actually do have whiskers, which is really interesting. They also, when we're talking about evolution, um, whale residual. Bone. 
here we go. This is a really, this one's good too. Um, they have what are considered residual structures. So we can see here, this is like a shoulder blade. I don't think that that would be considered a residual structure, um, but they do have shoulder blades and they also have like finger bones, right? And this, this would be in um, a side flipper. And then if we look here, these are residual, they, they just hang there. They're just kind of floating there. And this is a residual structure from an old hip bone um, that just hasn't, like evolution hasn't taken care of it yet. They still develop these things. Maybe one day they will not, but at this, po this point they do, which is also how we can tell that this was a creature that climbed out of the ocean, lived on land, and then climbed back in because like a shark would not have these. A uh, shark would have no use for hip bones. <laughs> Which is pretty fascinating. Apparently I can't spell residual, but it's still, still came up with that. I gotta drink the water. Holy smokes. Pretty much. I mean, I kind of want to be like, F that and go back, but you know. <laughs> I was spilling water on myself. That was good. All right, I'm gonna pause for just a sec. A lot of time for questions, comments, concerns, angry hate mail. Bring out some killer whales. enough water on the planet you guys I'm talking too much okay orcas woo I'm so excited so these are um my favorite sea creature and there are a lot of reasons it's not just you they're pretty although look at them. Duh. <laughs> um, orcas are really fascinating. Their common name is the killer whale. Uh, they are not actually whales. Even though their common name is killer whale, it's because they kill whales. <laughs> so orcas are the apex predator of the ocean. They exist in almost every ocean on the planet. Um, there are actually four types of orcas or um, four, are they species? I don't know if they're species. Um, there are four different types of orcas. We're going to take a look at them. Uh, really types, four types of orcas. Here we go. Which will bring up a list. Um... Open image and new tab. This is a really busy image. Um, oh, it's not even all there. I thought that it was just cut off by that. That was dumb. Okay, here we go. Let's try this. Okay. This lists five types of workers. I've been wrong the whole time. Oh, no, 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 no. Okay, I see. Wait, have I been wrong the whole time? Oh, here we go. This is what I'm looking for. Okay. I can do things. Let's scroll down. Okay, so we have types A, B, C, and D. They do tend to exist in totally different places. Am I wrong? I'm dead. Yeah, hi, dad. Uh, <laughs> they do tend to live in totally different places around the world. So the type that is local to me is actually type A. 
Um, you'll see that these guys have like a smooth, a smooth little rostrum head area, um, saddle patch, and they're pretty solid. Type B has this like variation coloring, right? And it has like that slightly yellow. And then type C has the same thing, but take a look at the difference in the eye patches here. So here, I might actually have these. I don't know. Anyway, so uh, we have like a smaller, longer eye patch here, a bigger, longer eye patch, and then we have like this weird swoop eye patch. Um, and you can see similarities in the face and the rostrum area of these first three types, A, B, and C. Where is S type? Weird tier list. It's not a tier list. <laughs> Uh, and then we get down to type D, which is really, really interesting. Um, and we're actually going to watch a short YouTube video. Um, yeah, these aren't, this isn't tier. It's not like one is better than the other. These are just literally different types. Um, type D is really interesting because if you look at the forehead here, they have a little bit more of like a bubbled forehead, like say a beluga whale would have. Um, and if you're not familiar with anything that I'm saying, please feel free to, to say that. So if you don't know what a beluga looks like, you can tell me it's okay. We're here to learn. We're here to have fun. Um, and I want to make sure you understand what I'm saying. <laughs> uh, so type D uh, is really fascinating because only recently were they ever caught on camera for the first time. Uh, type D has kind of been an urban legend, you know, per se. Um science was like sure that they existed but never got to see them and it's because they live you remember when we talked about ocean currents and how there's that one weird current that goes all the way around antarctica at the bottom of the world that's where type d live um it's some of the stormiest worst weather places uh on the planet it is very deep water it's very dangerous water to go boating in um and so for the most part it's too dangerous and it's very hard to study these type of whales so no one really has <laughs> No one's really ever, no one's ever really seen them. They've been spotted by like tourists and fishermen and things like that. Well, last year in 2019, the, um, it's a U.S. organization called the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Organization or NOAA, National Oceanic Administration, not organization, National Oceanic and Atmospheric administration, NOAA, uh, actually caught a video of type D's um, down off of the very bottom of South America. So let's see if we can find that video. I know that it exists. Um, and what they did is they took a, yep, here we go. They took a biological sample in order to confirm that it is a new species. And there are certain qualifications that have to be met for something to be a species. The biggest, the biggest, biggest, biggest thing that determines whether something is a different species or not, and this is why sometimes things look the same and you're like, why aren't those the same species, is that a species will never intermingle with another species. So you don't see crossbreeding. So like we have like ligers, which is a lion and a tiger. That's done by artificial insemination. Those two things would never naturally crossbreed. Um, so new species killer whale, Noah. Yep, here we go. Here's the official site. In January 2019, an experienced group of killer whale biologists launched an expedition from the southern tip of Chile into some of the roughest waters in the world, searching for what could be a new species of killer whale. Look at this. They are lovely and gorgeous. Look at those dorsal fins and that little tiny thing. Um, so let's take a look at this. I haven't seen this particular video, so this will be interesting. Over the years, I've worked with quite a few species of whales and dolphins, but for the last 15, 20 years or so, I've become intensely interested in killer whales. Killer whales are fascinating animals at the very top of food chains, pack hunters with great degree of learning. Right now, officially, there's one species of killer whale in the world, but there's at least a half a dozen very different looking types out there, and I think any one of them could be a different species. So since around the year 2000, 
We have described four different types of killer whales from Antarctic waters, and in 1955 there was a stranding in New Zealand, 17 oh. killer whales, and they were very different looking killer whales. They had a big round head, a very tiny little eye patch, the dorsal fin was kind of narrow and very pointy and swept back. No killer whales like that had ever been seen before. So interestingly, after the stranding occurred in New Zealand, there were no more reports of those types for decades. And then exactly 50 years later, the French researchers were showing me some photographs, and I'll never forget this, they had the little tiny eye patch and the round head, and I said, those They're are so the New pretty, Zealand killer whales. It was astonishing to see that these animals were alive, and I knew immediately what they were. So as part of our Antarctic killer whale research, we started collecting photographs of killer whales in the Southern Ocean to get an idea. So I'm just gonna pause this for a second, cause they're, um, like I said, I've never, I've never watched this video. This is brand new to me. Uh, and it's five minutes, but you know what? We're gonna watch it, so y'all stick with me. Um, but you'll notice that all of these dots are falling in that area uh, where the current just goes right around um, Antarctica. Yeah, about how these different types were distributed and the locations were very interesting. The type D killer whale didn't quite get into Antarctic waters, which is why we had so few records of them because they live in some of the nastiest uh, water in the world. So we had described type A, B, and C, and for the first time we called it type D killer whale. And then a colleague of mine sent me some photographs of type D killer whales around a toothfish vessel fishing off Cape Horn. And he said there have been a number of sightings in a, a rather narrow area. Once I got that information, I knew that this was probably the best place in the world where we could go to look for this animal. I'm so, so excited, right you guys. I've never seen this. We knew <laughs> that this expedition was a long shot. We were hoping for just a few good weather windows. Where we were off Cape Horn, you're either in a storm or you're between storms. We spent eight straight days at anchor in 40, 50, 60 knots of wind. It was so bad that we couldn't even get ashore. After our eight days at anchor, the captain said, you know, it looks like there's gonna be a break here between these two storm fronts. We might be able to get a few hours out there. And so we decided to pull anchor. We fought our way out to the location in very heavy weather. The next morning was our weather window. We got up at five in the morning, and shortly after that, there they were, type D killer whales. And to tell you the truth, there was just a moment of, oh my God, there they are. And then we immediately went into our roles as killer whale biologists and the mission that we had at hand there. We wanted to get underwater acoustic recordings because killer whales are very vocal and these different ecotypes are known to have distinctive vocalizations. We were also able to get hundreds and hundreds of photographs. Wow. And these are important because killer whales are one of the species that are individually identifiable based on unique shapes and markings on the dorsal fin, the saddle patch. But the most important thing that we wanted to do was to get tissue biopsy samples of these killer whales. We got the first ever sample of type B killer whales. Woo! Maybe the answer to our uh, question right here. So our next step is to analyze these skin and blubber biopsy samples in our molecular genetics laboratory. This will tell us how distinct these type D killer whales are from other killer whales, and we're very excited about the results of that analysis. And this is important stuff. If you're gonna do conservation work on anything, the first thing you have to know is how many species you're dealing with. And just to think that there's a whole new wow. killer whale out there that looks completely different. It's like, yeah, we need to look closer at, at, at what we have out here. Late 2020. Nice. I'm glad I found that video. Um, it was kind of an accident. <laughs> I spent so much time on the NOAA Fisheries website um, trying to find literally this information. Uh, it's so wholesome. I know, right? Uh, so it's funny because um, 
<laughs> we're about to get a little bit personal. Not too personal. I hope it's cool. Uh, I have an anxiety disorder. And uh, one of those, one of those, some of the things that are associated with that is like, I can be kind of obsessive about certain things and I can get really passionate about things. Um, but I also am a little bit of a perfectionist. And so like, I want to do like breaking edge uh, ethological research. So ethology is the scientific term for the study of behavior. And if we could like locate this and I could be a part of this project, that would be like, a dream for me after I graduate. Like, that's all I want. I want to be, like, on breaking edge research. And there's, like, orcas are highly researched. We know so much about them that there's not a lot of cutting edge research left. Um, so it'd be really cool to get on a project like this. Uh, I'm glad I found that video. I, I have found the ones that, like, circulate on YouTube that are from, um, like, those stupid vlogs that have, like, a thousand ads and then they'll throw something up. And I had confirmed it when I saw that. But I, I yeah. I, Noah saves whales with science. Uh, feature story... Um, yeah, so that was exciting. Thanks for watching that with me. Uh oh, okay, it's fine. <laughs> My whole screen went blank. I did a thing, did a thing. Um, so this is talking about uh, ecotypes and forms. This isn't necessarily like the four types or subtypes. Um, this is talking a little bit more about uh, where they're found and what they're called. So like here where I am at in Washington, off the coast of Washington, we have the Southern residents and then in Canada, they have the Northern resident residents, which is what these are. And then, um, we also see what are called Biggs killer whales or transient killer whales. Uh, the transient killer whales travel all the way from like the Aleutian islands in Alaska, uh, down to parts of California. They have a huge range range they don't call one specific spot home no. orcas are also really interesting um because they have very specific diets uh but the diets have a wide range so for example the bigs killer whale uh feeds primarily on um seals and sea lions that is their main source resident killer whales feed primarily on salmon specifically chinook salmon um, so we're going to get into, uh, some words that are Native American in origin. Chinook is one of them. Um, and here in a little bit, we'll talk about the legend of, of the killer whale and where they come, came from. We also have, um, and I don't know, like, I don't know that much about all the rest of these. Um, I know offshore killer whales, a lot like, uh, the subantarctic or the type D, um, that I've talked to that uh, they talked about in that video, offshore killer whales are really hard to study because they are so far offshore that like resources becomes an issue and weather becomes an issue and um, like ship maintenance becomes an issue. Like there are so many uh, hurdles that you have to, to jump over to study offshore killer whales um, that it can become really hard. Um, as far as, uh, there's, there's another group of killer whales and it's, I want to learn more about it. This is a group that I don't know that much about, but they actually are from, from Norway. They live in Norway. <laughs> They're off the shores of Norway and, uh, there is a large organization that researches them, um, in Norway. And it has also been one of my dreams to do research there. They have one of the fastest growing populations of killer whales in the world. Um, they have high fertility rates. They have like the perfect mix of everything. And my understanding is that a lot of that has to do um, with Norway's laws regarding uh, like ships and um, science and military testing and what happens in their waters. And there are a lot of regulations and um, the uh, people of Norway are very passionate about protecting those things and protecting their waters and so the orcas have the killer whales have a much easier time existing there 
because they don't face the hurdles that, for example, the southern resident killer whales do here with their their uh, ever decreasing population. Um, if you start looking at the southern residents. Uh, it's not just food and pollution that's an issue, but when we start dealing um, with pollution, let's talk. I mean, let's let's circle back, and this is one of the reasons that we talked about gyres and plastic and phytoplankton at the beginning is because um, Ch Chinook salmon are a primary consumer, so they're eating primary producers like phytoplankton. They're also eating other primary consumers, uh, so something can be both a primary consumer and a secondary consumer because the salmon are also eating like zooplankton and things like that. And the if there is plastic in the diet of the Chinook salmon or in the diet of the zooplankton, um, then you know, we talked about energy transfer, then that organism doesn't have as much energy to transfer up the food line or the food chain or the trophic chain, the trophic ladder, whatever you decide that you want to call it right now. So when we're talking about that, we're saying that that Chinook salmon is not getting the energy transfer that it needs, which means that when it gets eaten by a killer whale or a southern resident killer whale, because that's really what we're talking about when we're talking about Chinook salmon, then that killer whale is not getting the nutrients that it needs. So there are a number of local issues uh, about the killer whales that are very prominent that have to do with salmon breeding and the fact that there really aren't enough salmon. But there's also the issue that the salmon that they do eat are not nutritious enough. They're not passing on enough energy for these killer whales to continue um, to get the nutrients that they need and it's causing infertility infertility issues and so there's a lot of um, problems where southern residents will not be able to carry um a calf, a, a baby orca, a calf to term or when they do carry it to term a lot of times it'll die like we talked I know we've talked before in this channel about the tour of grief that happened in 2017 when Taliqua um southern resident orca carried her baby for 17 days she carried it for 17 days it survived less than 20 minutes she carried it for 17 days with the love support of her, her family of orcas um but yeah so there are all kinds of challenges that are faced when we don't take care of our oceans and it's not just not just it's not as simple as it seems to be. It's not as simple as saying, you know, let's, for instance, this is one of the things that we talk a lot about locally. Let's, it's not as simple as just break the Snake River dams to allow the salmon to breed because if the salmon are still receiving substandard food and they're not getting the nutrients they need, they don't have nutrients to pass up. Let's talk about something happier. Orcas have one of the most interesting diversity in behaviors and calls of any marine mammal. They are technically a dolphin. Each family group or pod has its own series of calls. So when you, maybe not you or me, <laughs> but when an orca is recorded, a lot of times, even if it's, say they found an orca alone in the ocean, they record the call, they can, science can match it up to which family group it belongs to simply by the kind of calls it's giving. Each family group has um, basically its own lingo. So science doesn't like to call any kind of animal anything a language. So we will never say, you know, this group has its own language, but they do have series of calls that are unique to them, which is also why when you start putting a variety of killer whales um, in a tank who don't know each other or aren't or who aren't from the same family, for instance, like a theme park might do, that's when you start having issues. They can't communicate. Can you imagine, like, just you and someone who doesn't speak your language are stuck in a place and you can't communicate with each other? How frustrating would that be? Also, and we're going to hit YouTube up for this one, they have really cool hunting behaviors. Not only do they have... Ooh, what's happening here? <laughs> um, not only do they have their own 
calls and communication methods. They also have their own behaviors. That's why you learn a lot of languages. You're very smart to talk. So smart. I love it. Um, they have their own hunting behaviors, the way that they hunt. This is cultural. So different family groups will hunt in different ways. A lot of times you'll see similarities in killer whales that live in the same area. But if you start to look out across the planet, you start to see a lot of variety of behaviors, uh, especially when it comes to hunting and including teaching young to hunt. So what we're going to look at now is um, I don't even know if I'm going to be able to find the exact video, but it's kind of the same. It's a really fascinating video of wave hunting where orcas will try and knock a seal off of an ice floe. Um, and what they do is that, man, I wish my camera was working. Oh, hold on. I've been charging the battery. Let's see if we can do it. You guys are so cute. Cute kittens. set up right but we will find out momentarily fix my hair well I've done things before okay let's see if it's fixed ah it's fixed yeah okay so when we have um the video that we're going to watch, there's there's a family of killer whales. I want to say it's in the Arctic, so like near Greenland-ish. Uh, this might even be Alaska, somewhere with ice. And so what they'll do is they participate in what's wave, wave hunting. So a group of them, you'll have the ice flow. You'll have your little, well, you don't have a little thing. You have a seal. <laughs> okay. And then uh, together they will swim at the ice float and then they duck under. And what that does is it causes the ice float to tip like this. And usually, okay, that was a dumb seal. But usually what happens is the seal will hold on, but as they go under, it tips that way. And then it goes back up that way and the water will wash over. And so the water washes over and they, um, it washes the seal off. So we're going to watch this because it's, it's one of my favorite hunting videos. You've seen it. Yeah, it's fantastic. It's so great. Uh, there's also some, uh, the killer whales that live off the coast of Norway hunt largely herring. And so they have this really interesting technique where they will, um, like surround them and they hit them with echolocation, which stuns them. And then they, oh, it's so cool. Okay. Um, orca ice. Orca seal ice flow. Someone can't spell flow, but. Mm, 402. That's probably going to be a beach one. Let's see. Is this it? No. I don't want people in my video. Yep, here we go. You guys can see it. <laughs> How are they divvying him up? <laughs> this is really low quality. So what you see is they're poking their heads up. That's called spy hopping. And they're taking a look at their surroundings. We're trying to figure out exactly where the seal is. They're twisting the ice. There it is. See? 
I love listening to the people in this video. If you can't watch the bullfight, you better leave. <laughs> that guy. <laughs> Oh, here they come, two of them. Look at yep. underneath there. You can see them underneath. There goes again. And if I'm remembering this video correctly, um, if you watch, there's one orca that's smaller than the rest of them, and they're actually teaching that orca how to hunt. Uh, yeah, see that one on the right? see how little he is which is why i'm assuming they're not just jumping up because he's really close to the edge of the ice and it wouldn't be anything for them to just reach up and grab him so they're teaching the little one how to hunt here they come they made a big wave look at that big wave Flopping around. I think he jumps back up on an ice floe. I don't remember. There's still like 30 seconds left. I know that woman. <laughs> killer whale had put him up there, or he somehow escaped their clutches. He did not escape. Perhaps they're training the young. That's the young what they're worker. doing. Yeah. Who knows? This video is less about hunger and more about training, which is a really uh, fascinating thing, in my opinion. Um, but yeah, the commentary on that is hilarious. Um, it's really funny. Um, Hearing. Let's see if we can get uh, Orca. Let's see. Don't. Okay, here we go. Let's try this one. I understand that, Melly, absolutely. And I'm sorry if these videos are upsetting to you. I find them very fascinating. I know Talk asked me once um, if I was rooting for the sea or, or, or was it the sea otter one that we might watch too, if I was rooting for the sea otter or the orca. And the truth is neither. Like, to me, this is, this is nature and it's really fascinating um, for me. But yeah, this is a really interesting video. Uh, you can see how they surround it. Orcas um, are often called the wolves of the sea. Um, and they, they do, they pack hunt. I'm glad you're still here, by the way, I'm Amelie. Oh yeah, you can kind of see the overlay in Norwegian Orca survey. Let's see who did this one. That's a lot of herring. Sea pandas. Sea pandas. Oh, 
Um, a lot of people don't realize um, hostility. <laughs> That's fair, Doc. That's fair. Um, Orcas have, like, they're hugely curious. And they've never actually, um, not actually, it's not like they've had failed attempts, but they've never injured, no orca has ever injured or killed someone in the wild. It only happens in captivity. Uh, there is a video, it's one of my favorites, and it really demonstrates the curiosity of killer whales. Um, I'm trying to remember. Mm, server. No. Uh. This is it. It's only 42 seconds. No, oh, it's a GoPro. <laughs> Just chilling. I understand. Absolutely. He's just chilling on his paddleboard. The sork is like, what you doing? <laughs> oh! <laughs> Snack time! <laughs> their orcas are fascinating i don't know that i ever have a desire to be in the water with them i want to touch one one day i don't know that i ever want to be in the water um that reminds me i don't think i have the photo anymore or at least not at easy access i meant to get it brought up my a friend of mine um they're so smart it's insane how smart they are uh, a friend of mine I have a lot of friends that kayak, but she went kayaking up kind of near, uh, so I am in the southern part of Puget Sound. Let's, hold on. Let's do this. I'm not going to show you, like, exactly where I live. <laughs> Might be easier to do maps, actually. Yeah, here we go. Let me shrink that. Um, these are all coffee places. <laughs> I've marked all the coffee places on my map. Um, so up in here is where the orcas generally reside. Uh, so this is what are known as the San Juan Islands. Well, they are dolphins, so they're at least equally as smart. <laughs> um, yeah, that's a good question. I don't know the answer to that. Hmm. I don't know the answer to that. Um, so this is the San Juan Islands. Uh, so this border here is Canada. So this is Vancouver, Canada. Um, I actually I went here on vacation fairly recently and I could see Canada. And I have a friend that lives in Canada and I messaged her and I'm like, I can see your home country. <laughs> oh, it was kind of funny. Um... But yeah, so this is the San Juan Islands, which is roughly about where the orcas generally reside. So on San Juan Island, you can see we even have an orcas island. On San Juan Island, um, there is a place called Friday Harbor and there is a place called Friday Harbor Labs. And Friday Harbor Labs is actually owned and operated by the college that I want to go to. So the college that I want to go to is located in Seattle, um, University of Washington. They have one of the best marine biology programs in the nation and they have connections to actual real orcas. So yay. Oh, we can do satellite. Well, that's gross. Let's not do that. <laughs> um, so I live here-ish. I'm being very general because I don't want to tell you guys where I actually live. But I live here-ish. So I live at the bottom of what is known as Puget Sound. So this whole area here is Puget Sound. Um, and I live at the bottom of it. We very rarely get orcas. We do have like harbor porpoises. And uh, I think that someone saw a gray whale off the coast not that long ago, which is super rare. That never happens. Um, 
but we do sometimes get orcas down here. In fact, when I was a kid, they were right in here, I believe, somewhere. And I remember my parents were like, oh my God, the orcas are like right here. And they had to take me because I have loved orcas since I was a child. Uh, by the way, this is my home state. <laughs> Uh, this part is all on fire. <laughs> In fact, this part is all on fire. In case anyone is wondering. <laughs> um, so yeah, they don't come down here very often. Uh, but we have our own sea life and cool stuff. But I want to be here where the orcas are. I forgot where I was going with that story. Someone would like to remind me. They can. That's fine. Um, I want to say that the Norwegian orcas, uh, I don't know Norway as much as I, okay. I want to say they're up here near Tromso. I'm probably pronouncing that incorrectly. It might not be. I don't know. Look, it's Dese. And... Ah! Wow, okay. I don't know where things are. <laughs> Talk! <laughs> Slash the belly. <laughs> I don't know European countries. Leave me alone. <laughs> Shut up, Talk! <laughs> For some reason, I thought... Uh, yeah, kayaking. That's right. Oh, yeah, she was kayaking. Um, so she was kayaking. Thank you, Mameli. She was kayaking up near Deception's Pass, which I believe is, like, right up in here. Um, I appreciate you. <laughs> Thanks, Doc. <laughs> I'm never gonna let that down. <laughs> never, ever, ever. <laughs> Um, so she was kayaking near Deception's Pass and it was just like in this little inlet, um, near a bridge and all of a sudden there were like four orcas in the water and she was like, what the hell? And she got a picture. Um, hold on. Let's do this. I'm going to see if I can find it really quick, uh, so that I can show you guys. I have to go to Facebook. <laughs> Why? Why do you prompt me to log in? Mm. And it was a while ago, so even then, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it. Here we go. Photos. I mean, this was like five or six years ago. So there's um, a lot of laws around how close you can get and what you can do and sound uh, when you come across orcas. Okay, that's a kayaking photo. Yeah, this is... Pass it? Was it actually up here? Um, so she did what she was supposed to do. Kitties! Yep. They're asleep. They're also very messy. Messy today. Um, but she did what she was supposed to do, which is basically, like, stop what she was doing, get out of the way. Um, you basically have to yield to orcas. That's really what the law says. You can't approach them. You can't anything. Um, there's, like, posters, like, be whale wise posters. Um, which is actually kind of ironic now that I'm thinking about it, considering that orcas aren't whales, but not the point. Um, okay. It has to be one of these. 
Here it is. Okay. And she will not mind me sharing this because she's already given me permission in the past to share this photo. She's not actually in it, so. Oh, why? Son of a. <laughs> okay, here we go. I thought that that's what I did. Apparently that's not what I did. I don't know what I did. Um, I'll close that. Um, she got really, really close. I was really curious, so I actually did some research on the whale that she encountered. Um, and it was one of the, um, transient orcas so there were there were a number of transients there uh they were hanging out with their friends <laughs> the orcas do have friends they have other orcas that they prefer to hang out with uh, sometimes they're cousins there's actually some cross um pod relationships so the southern residents have jk and l pods and sometimes you'll see like k and l pods hanging out together uh the belief or the thought is scientifically that both or all three of those pods jk and l originally had one matriarch or one um they were all they all used to be one pod essentially they have very similar calls and things like that uh but she got really close and i remember talking to her about it because i was like i'm so jealous of you <laughs> and she was like i was so scared <laughs> And I was like, okay, yeah, story checks out. Because uh, there's, what, maybe 20 feet between them? And um, this is a male bull orca, fully grown, which means that, like, you can't really see the size here. But that dorsal fin is about six feet tall. And that male orca is probably pretty close to 40 feet long. And, like, 14 tons. Like, he's big, he is huge. And I did, like I said, I did do identification on him. I don't remember who he is. Um, I mean, we could do it now if you guys want to see that process. It's kind of a fun process. Um, we can bring this over here. And then I know that he was a big, uh, big killer whales. Um, so orcas are identified by their dorsal fin, which is this here. <laughs> I would shit my whole pants. <laughs> yeah, pretty much that. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, so killer whales are identified, and they talked a little bit about it in the video that we watched earlier, but they're identified by their dors dorsal fin and what's called their saddle patch, which is this... Uh, it varies from gray to white um, patchy area right behind the dorsal fin. Now, this is kind of lucky in the sense that this killer whale has a very distinct dorsal fin. So he has this like notch that's taken out right here. So what we're going to do is we're going to search. It's, it's a little bit harder to do ID without scientific resources. Um, Photo identification catalog. So research gate, that's pretty good. I don't know if we're gonna be able to access this. Some things are behind a paywall. Uh, nope. PDF available, download full text PDF. Uh, save. We'll see if this is actually what we want. <laughs> We are all very different people. I would be super fascinated. I wouldn't want to make any noise, that's for sure. Although I would probably start crying. Um, let's be fair. So let's see, because this should, I'm thinking this should be a photo identification guide. Uh, preface, introduction, materials and methods, acknowledgements. Um, I'm hoping that there's photos. I think there should be. Oh, geez. Yep, here we go. Okay. 
And so we can see, like, even just here, <coughs> a difference in dorsal fin and saddle patch, even just between these two, okay? And then we can also see some scarring, okay? So all of these dorsals are different. So I'm, I'm, I think that this is birthier. I don't know because I didn't read the abstract or anything like that. So there's no way for me to know that. Oh. <gasps> Yay! You're my favorite dad. You're my only, only dad. dad. But that, you're still my favorite. <laughs> uh, I've had pizza delivered, you guys. <laughs> so um, you can see that there's a difference here. So we're just going to look for a male that has, and see, this is a much straighter, much taller um, dorsal fin, but we're gonna look for a male that has the same notching pattern as the other one. So if we go like, blip. Can you give it a class? You would think so, but no. I actually have friends that are interested in this. They're that interested in this? I don't know, but this is where we're going. <laughs> hey guys, just nod your head and smile. <laughs> <laughs> Here we go. All right. It also depends on when this article was written. <laughs> they said, yep. <laughs> um, but yeah, it depends on when this was written. Here we go. T20. See this pattern here, and we can't see that much of his of his um, saddle patch, but you see the angle at which the saddle patch comes from the back of the fin. <laughs> that angle is probably very similar to this one if this photo had been taken uh, from a regular boat down. <laughs> so we can say that this is a male. This is that is identified as T20 and was likely born before 1963. And the way that this chart works is that this is going to be his mother. Okay. Who was born before 1968. That's all they know. Or wait, T21. Hmm. Okay. Maybe I don't know. Maybe I'm reading that chart wrong. That's usually, that's usually how it works. But see, we just identified an orca. Good job, you guys. You're a scientist today. You had no idea, did you? <laughs> I'm totally saving the scientific article. BT Dubs. It's really great. <laughs> Ta-da! Oh, I love this photo. It's like my favorite photo. One of my favorite photos, anyway. Poggers! Poggers! We identified an orca! <laughs> yeah, good job. I'm proud of y'all. Okay. I'm gonna save that. Well, it's on my download, so... Awesome sauce. Um, there was something else I was going to say that I was thinking of. Saddle patches, orcas, dorsal fins, family lines. I don't remember now. <laughs> orcas do a lot of cool things. ResearchGate is fantastic. Um, I am on ResearchGate. You can join for free. If anyone's interested and likes to read scientific articles, <laughs> I might have too much spare time. Okay, we've looked at that. That's the state of Washington. How are we doing, folks? Are we having fun still? Are we learning things? Free, free? Free, free. I pay nothing to belong to ResearchGate. Uh, in fact, let's, let's look at it really quick. I'm going to get rid of that. <laughs> Indeed. Um, so you can join for free. I'm going to log in really quick because I'm already a member, uh, under my, Oh, oh, good. Yeah, I there's there's a couple more things I want to discuss. We're about to wrap up on orcas, and we're going to talk about shrimp just for a little bit. Um, and then, yeah, I would like to eat my pizza before it gets cold. <laughs> so.
so you are totally good talk you're in a good place um so i don't know actually if you need a student account or like a staff account to belong to research gate um we could probably look that up but a really great thing is that like if i look at my notifications oh 2018 okay um so like i i can be followed and i can follow uh so caitlin bosley i have actually cited her work and some of my work on shrimp um john william chapman or dr chapman was my pi or my primary investigator when i was working on my research project which is what we're going to talk about next um but i can also follow people so i don't know I don't care about that. Uh, following. So if we look here, um, I can follow research topics. I can follow specific researchers. Uh, so, you know, I said that Dr. John Chapman is one of the leading invasive species specialists. Uh, I hadn't really planned on it, Mameli, but I probably can. Um, I would be open to that if you guys want some Minecraft. I will need to take a break for lunch when we're done with this, though. Um, but, but there is, and I am blanking on his name. If I see it, I'm going to recognize it. But there's a gentleman who is the leading uh, invasive species person in the world. Hold on, I've got so many messages. What's happening? You're too many messages. Okay, everything's fine. <laughs> After the stream is shutting down, I don't blame you. It's already 9 p.m. 9.30 p.m. <laughs> oh, that means it's 9.30 p.m. for you too, Amelie. Are you going to be able to come on for some Minecraft? I will definitely be doing Minecraft on Thursday. Undoubted. Um, I work all day tomorrow, so I'm not streaming at all tomorrow, but I will be doing some Minecraft on Thursday at 1 p.m. LA time, which should be 10 p.m. Yale's time. Or I'm sorry, 22. I don't know. I don't know how y'all do time. Um, but yeah, so I can pick uh, subjects. I have topics. Uh, ecology, marine biology are the topics that I follow, um, and I can follow specific research or specific researchers uh, with ResearchGate. Uh, another thing, and talk if you're really interested in learning things, um, always be careful with Google. Always be careful with Wikipedia. Anyone can edit Wikipedia. Um, so never, ever cite that as a source. I use Wikipedia to find other sources sometimes. It's a great jumping off point or to get a general overview of a topic. Uh, but what you can do is uh, Google has scholar.google.com. And this is specifically for, of course, I know internet sucks. <laughs> Some people don't know. I didn't know that before I got to college. I had no idea. Um, Google Scholar is specifically for scientific research articles. Uh, so if I wanted to put in killer whales, this is pulling up scientific articles. Now, a lot of times these are gonna be behind paywalls but here's a tip. Any researcher worth anything, and that's like 99% of them, want to share their work. Uh, it costs money to su subscribe to scientific journals, um, which is stupid on so many levels. Not that it costs money, but that it costs like $800 a year. But if you, for instance, say I wanted to read this, pod specific, um, Demography of Killer Whales, or Orcanus Orca, which is the scientific name, and say this entire thing is behind a paywall, and it wants me to pay. If you reach out to the primary investigator, which is always going to, or generally going to be the first person listed on this article, and say, hey, I'm really interested in your article titled Pod-Specific Demography of Killer Whales, or Orcanus Orca. I tried to read it, but it's behind a paywall. Would you mind sending me a copy? 99% of the time, they're just going to be excited that you want to look at their work. So they will send you a copy, um, which is pretty cool. 
Oh, cool. This also tells you, I didn't know this, this, this particular site tells you uh, how many times it's been referenced uh, in other journal, car journal articles, which is pretty cool also. A lot of information I'm throwing at you, I know. So we're gonna, we're gonna jump off Orcas uh, and kind of start wrapping up. I wanted to talk a little bit about my research experience. Um, it was a lot of fun. I learned a lot of things. I cannot... Oh, that's okay. Welcome, Yizzy. Um, I'm glad that you're here now. Super glad that you're here now. You will have to watch the VOD. We have gone over so many different things. Um, and if you're watching the VOD, actually, here, let me, um, let's do this. Face whoosh. Hello. Oh, God, my hair. Um, <laughs> I have to fix that. I can't leave it, you guys. Um, okay, that's a little bit better. Okay, if you are watching the VOD, you're having a good time, you're... You unfortunately couldn't make make the live or whatever. Uh, even if you're watching this one, it finally makes its way to YouTube. And you have a question, feel free to hit me up. Um, you can message me. I don't know if YouTube has a messaging system, but you can leave. Um, don't leave a comment. I'll never get back to that. Hit me up on Twitch. You can do whispers or messaging on Twitch. Um, my... Um, here. Here. <laughs> my Twitter is there so you're free to hit me up on Twitter if you have questions keep in mind like I I am a I'm still a student there are still a lot of things I don't know I have my associate's degree in biology and I'm talking about things that fascinate me so I have followed up on them and I have researched them in my own time these are a lot of these things are things that I've learned on my own uh all the oceanography stuff that we did I learned in a classroom a lot of the biology stuff I learned in a classroom um but I like to share and these are the things that I'm passionate about so if you're watching this VOD or you're lurking and you think of or even if you're here in chat and you think of something later feel free to hit me up because I want to have these conversations um these are the conversations that get me excited and get me talking and all that stuff so feel free to do that um now I want to talk a little bit about the research that I did. So two years ago, I had an opportunity to do a research project. It was through the Na um, National Science Foundation here in the States or the NSF. And what happens is the NSF funds other organizations to host interns, scientific interns, to do scientific research. And so the project that I was on was a field research project, which is very important to me. I only applied to projects where I would be working in the field because that is my eventual career goal. And I wanted to know now if I want to do field work, if it's worth it to work in the field, because the worst thing would be to end up $100,000 in debt after I get, you know, my, my degrees and things like that. And I don't know if it's going to be hundred thousand but it probably will is to end up a hundred thousand dollars in debt get into my career and go this fucking sucks I hate it why did I ever think that this is what I wanted to do so I wanted to get out I wanted to get dirty I wanted to be in the field well I got my wish <laughs> the um I was accepted to an internship at Hatfield Marine Science Center, which is located in Newport, Oregon in the United States. Hatfield is run and organized by Oregon State University. I had the immense privilege to work with and under Dr. Uh, John Chapman, who is one of the leading invasive species specialists in the country, as well as Dr. Brett Dumbald, who works for the Oregon De uh, Department of Fish and Wildlife. Uh, he has been monitoring um, the shrimp species that we're about to talk about uh, for years. He has tracked a number of extinction events related to this species, which are done uh, with formulas and calculations and things like that very excited to talk to you about this. There are a lot of things that I cannot share. I will not be sharing uh, data that we we observed or took in, or recorded, or anything like that for the simple reason that like I haven't talked to my PI, I haven't talked to Dr. Chapman, uh, and I am not free to release these things on my own, especially because this is unpublished research. Um, I am supposed to be writing the scientific paper, and I haven't. <laughs> so... Yeah. Uh, anyway, so we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what are called mud shrimp. So mud shrimp literally live in the mud. Uh, the shrimp that we were investigating uh, are called blue mud shrimp. We uh, Their scientific name is Eupagea 
Upajibia pugetensis. We just called them Upos, like the entire time I was there. Although there are a number of different, so Upo is the, uh, Upajibia is the genus, pugetensis is the species. There are a number of different species of Upajibia. So even though we called them Upos, it's a, it's, it was a blanket term. <laughs> You shush. I'm surprised you're still here, Daisy. I thought I lost you a long time ago. <laughs> um, so we're going to talk a little bit about UFOs because they're really, really interesting. Uh, fair enough. Um, Upajibia or blue mud shrimp, I guess, um, are a type of brewing. <laughs> your, your brain exploded. That's fair. That's my brain's about to explode too. I'm gonna eat pizza soon. It's fine. Uh, so Yupos are, ooh, that's in the frame. Let's not do that. Um, a species of burrowing, burrowing, words are hard, burrowing mud shrimp. Uh, they live in estuaries. So an estuary is any place where fresh and salt water meet. Uh, the estuary that we were working on, we can actually take a look here since we have the map up. Let's do that. Um, whoop. Yep, here. I actually have it on the map. Um, so this is Hatfield Marine Science Center is where I was. And the estuary that we were studying is right in here. Um, it was called the Idaho Flat. So what happens is when the tide goes out, all that you're left with is a bunch of mud. <laughs> Uh, all that you're left with is a bunch of mud, which seems really boring, but all of the things you guys that live in that mud is super fascinating. So what I did, uh, we were examining, um, and one of the reasons I talked about trophic order earlier, in addition to it just being important when we're talking about marine biology, is that that was part of my research uh, that I did at Hatfield, is we were examining the trophic position of the shrimp, of the blue mud shrimp. And in order to do that, we had to do uh, a massive amount of organism collection. So I would say that we collected probably close to a thousand shrimp. Uh, maybe, no, actually, yeah, it was probably pretty close to a thousand shrimp uh, over the two month period that I was there. We also collected a number of other species and we cut tissue samples from those, identified um, the sex and reproductive status of the shrimp dried the tissue samples, flew it to a lab in Alaska, which for those who aren't from here, is up here. So we were in this area here, here. we were in Juneau. Uh, so we were in this area here. So we drove from Oregon to Seattle and then flew to Alaska. And the reason we went to Alaska is we were collaborating with a National Oceanic and Atmospheric Lab um, up there with a gentleman that Dr. Chapman knew. Um, I know him as Todd. He has another name. Oh, so sorry. We were collaborating with the lab. It was a great trip. It was fantastic. Um, so we got to do a lot of sample sorting. We got to use like super sensitive equipment, which was so much fun. I totally made mistakes. 10 out of 10, 11 out of 10 would do again. Uh, uh, so we were able to determine kind of the trophic position. There were big, bigger, deeper questions involved in that that I'm not going to get into because that's a whole different level of stuff. But I did want to kind of talk a little bit about um, the shrimp. And to do that, we're going to look at this. We're going to ignore most of the questions. I'm using this primarily uh, for the pictures. Um, so if we are looking at this, um, this is a totally different, it's fine. So this is the shrimp that we were studying. This is the blue mud shrimp. Um, and you can see, I think that they're adorable. And the funny thing is, is that even though these are not shrimp that we eat, I don't eat shrimp anymore. <laughs> <laughs> I like fell in love with them while I was on the mud flat, so I don't eat shrimp anymore. This is not the presentation that I wanted. Um, this is the presentation that I wanted. So this is what the mud flats look like. Um, and if you look on the right hand side, you see all these little, little pox. Um, these are actually the shrimp burrows. And then you can see, uh, this is literally the line. This is the edge. So where this water is separates what is a shrimp bed from what is not a shrimp bed. Yeah, they definitely don't. 
They don't look like shrimp that you've seen before because the shrimp that you've seen before are likely like ocean shrimp, um, like jumbo shrimp and things like that, shrimp that you would eat. These are not eating shrimp. These are mud shrimp. They are totally different. You would never eat a mud shrimp. They are quite gross. Um, so it's really interesting because when you're walking out on the mud flat, we would, you can actually see a shoe print right here. That's really funny. Um, you can walk perfectly fine. Like on this side of the mud flat, no problems at all. The moment you step over here, you sink down. It's, it's like faster than quicksand. It's horrifying. I actually got stuck out there. They made a joke that they were going to bring me like a scuba mask. Um, <laughs> not funny guys. Um, because I couldn't get my foot out. I stopped wearing, I stopped wearing boots after that. Cause I was wearing, um, boots and waders and I still wore the waders, but I put like zip ties around my ankles so that they didn't slide off or down. Um, because it's much easier to just pull a straight foot out <laughs> than it is a boot out. Um, and the, the burrows for the shrimp are Y shaped, which is really cool because when you're looking at these pots here, it just looks like a bunch of holes, but every one of these holes represents a, the top, uh, one of the tops of the burrows. And so there's this like U shape here and then this down here. So it's really kind of fun because if you go out and you push your finger into one of the holes. So if I push my finger in this, like in this hole here, it's too late. You've already done it. Uh, if you push your finger down in this hole here, then water squirts out the top over here because they're connected. It's so much fun, you guys. It's like the best thing ever. Um, and this is what they look like on the inside. So we can see that the inside is kind of like this brownish rust color in comparison to the mud um, out here. And that's because there's an oxidation process that happens that I'm not going to go into. Um, but there's a chemical reason that that shrimp row is a totally different color. And then here you can see how I marked that they're super fuzzy. They're so cute. Look at them. Now, one of the reasons that we were studying these shrimp is that they're actually under attack. This is kind of where uh, we, we talked a little bit about invasive versus introduced species. Um, these shrimp are under attack from an invasive species. So you can see um, like this carapace on the side is super smooth. But if you look over here, there's this giant bulge. This is a parasite. I think that there are photos of the parasite. Um, yeah. So if we look here. Uh, Ortheone griffinus is the parasite. Um, it looks like something out of Alien. And I I swear to you, you guys. So what would happen is we would bring the shrimp back and then we would put them in the freezer for keeping. Exactly like they were. And the, there would be times where, like, the parasite would fall out. So we weren't sure which shrimp it went to but there was a parasite that was in the freezer for like four days and I went to put it under the microscope and it started moving like something out of a space horror movie it was terrifying it was so scary you guys so scary oh my god <laughs> um but the parasites are really interesting actually because this one um so this here is a female uh, this is an Ortheone griffinus uh, female. And the males look almost like little potato bugs. Uh, they're just small and thin and white. And until they have a host, they have no sex. So the first Ortheone griffinus to settle inside of a host becomes the female. I know. I know, Mameli. It's terrifying. It's a horror movie. <laughs> But the first Ortheone griffinus to settle inside of a host becomes a female, and then the second one becomes the male, and then they reproduce from there. Um, and it's kind of a problem because basically what's happening is these guys take up uh, so much, th they're blood suckers, and they take up so much blood from the shrimp that the shrimp no longer, here we come back, we're circling back, everything is about energy. The shrimp no longer has the energy necessary to reproduce. So it effectively castrates all shrimp, male and female, um, which is leading to a decline in population, which is where we start seeing those extinction events that Dr. Dumbold uh, was observing because of this invasive species um, in the parasite. And then if we go back a level, you know, we talked a little bit about trophic levels. And when we were doing our um, spectral analysis with the mass spectrometer, we were looking specifically at um, 
nitrogen 15 and carbon 13 and I'm not going to get into what makes them 15 or 13 um but as we start to see an increase in nitrogen 15, we can assume that that organism is on a higher trophic level. And as we start to see an increase on carbon 13, um, that helps us determine energy level of food webs. Uh, so we're seeing basically, uh, let me pull up that thing. So if we, if we take our little pointer here, um, we can say that a lower, something lower in the food chain is going to happen right down here. So we would expect to see our primary producers or our plants or our phytoplankton down here. And then something that exists up here is going to be like, for example, an apex. And that's on like a huge graph. But so we would expect that there would be like this line here, like this 45 degree angle, which is interesting because after we ran our samples, this is what we got. I'm not going to break it down. I'm not going to tell you what this means. Um, but we can see our trophic outline there, which is pretty cool. I end here. Um, and again, I'm not going to go through all. This is like my official presentation uh, at the end of the um, thing. So uh, it was really fun. These shrimp are really, really interesting. The slides don't go into it because it wasn't important for the research that I was presenting. Um, but these shrimp are really aggressive. <laughs> <laughs> they actually, so when we did a uh, shrimp collection out on the mud flat, uh, every shrimp had its own bag. We would just have like pockets full of bags. Like everyone had bags on them at all times. And it would be really funny um, because we, you pick up a shrimp and you put it in a bag and then you seal the bag and that's it. That's what happens. Uh, because what had happened is when they first started doing research on these shrimp is they would just take buckets out and they just throw the shrimp in a bucket because it's more economical, you use less plastic, it's easier. But when they got the bucket back to the lab, all of the shrimp were dead. <laughs> because they're so aggressive they kill each other on site and only when we're talking about those burrows is there a picture of the burrows in this slide oh that's not my research that's why so when we're looking at this burrow um this is the burrow for one shrimp only one shrimp lives in this burrow the only reason that they ever come together is to mate it's the only reason that two shrimp will ever be in one burrow, except, of course, like when um, there's a specific period of time when baby shrimp are in there. But even then, once a female shrimp lays her eggs, they wash out into the water column. They do all of their growing out here somewhere and then they come back in with the tide and they form their own burrow. And if you pull a shrimp out of a burrow, it's already dead it will not go back in the burrow. It will not go in another burrow. So sometimes as we would be doing research, we would just kind of find one of these blue mud shrimp out on the flat and we just pick it up and put it in a bag because it cannot, <laughs> it cannot um, find its burrow again. Uh, and it was also kind of interesting because you get to see the, the behavior of other wildlife. So a lot of people just don't think about seagulls and I didn't think about seagulls, but when the seagulls knew when we were out there doing research that they could steal shrimp from us. And sometimes we would have to chase them off because they would try and steal the shrimp that we were using for research, which is not a clue. Not cool. Not cool. Seagulls. Not cool. Um, Yeah. I did another research project, but I can't find, hi dog, I know that you're needy. I can't find the poster for it. I know that it's somewhere, um, but I did research when I came back from this project and after my oceanography class. Um, my oceanography instructor, professor, uh, Dr. Ralph Hitz had opened up an opportunity to do research at the college. And I put so much time and effort into that. I only got three credits for it. And I wish I had made it a five credit class because I definitely did enough work for five credits. Um, but it was a really cool project. I did uh, water sampling throughout the water column all the way from the very top of the water. Um, I went down nine meters and looked at the concentration of microplastics. And it was actually, it was pretty interesting. We got some interesting results and the results really stated that there wasn't a difference, um, at least not in our local waters. So, yeah. So I guess, I mean, that's kind of all that I had thought of and all that I had planned. I'm sure that I forgot things along the way. Um, but before we wrap up, does anyone have any questions? Questions? 
This is my jam. It's my love. My dog is angry and my stomach is growling. I'm glad that you're all here and I'm glad that you're having fun. <laughs> Talk is full. <laughs> That's fair. Absolutely fair. I guess I'm going to say that that's probably it for today. Uh, thank you so much, you guys, for letting me, like, nerd out. And uh, in a lot of ways, this stream was Talk's idea. Um, I know I had mentioned that I was thinking about it. And he was like, that sounds really great. You should do that. <laughs> so this is basically an extension of many of the ramblings that I've had before, which is really great. Um, and I appreciate you all being here and being interested and the questions, um, and the fact that I really didn't lose anyone. Blame me, chat. Nope, no blame. This is great. This is fantastic. You blame for bad things, not for good things. Um, yeah, we'll, we'll talk about eating sand on your stream day, say. <laughs> I will say that I've probably eaten more than my fair share of, uh, of mud after that summer. Oh man, every day. <laughs> There's a lot, I have a lot of cool pictures and stuff from that and I really need to start working on pulling the data together and writing a scientific article. Um, to write a scientific article as an undergrad is basically unheard of. Uh, so I really should do it because it's going to look really good. Yeah, well thanks Doc. Yeah, see, Mameli liked it. I'm glad that you were all here today. Um, this is not my normal. So if this is like, if you're watching this VOD or you're lurking in chat or whatever, um, I do usually ramble, it's true. And a lot of times I ramble about biology and marine biology and science because those are the things that I'm really pas passionate about. Passionate about, Jesus. Um, I do typically play Minecraft, a wide variety of Minecraft. I have a chemistry series uh, kind of going on right now. I play vanilla with some friends on the Crimson Nation server. And then I have a subtech uh, series going on with DSA and I think talk soon. Um, so Minecraft is usually what's on this channel. I also occasionally play the Isle or some other game. Excuse me, very rarely to just chatting. But I'm glad that you could all be here. I hope that you had fun. Uh, if you did have fun and this is your first time or you haven't already, make sure to hit that follow button so you get notifications when I go live. You can also follow me on Twitter at IRL Zombie Tabby. The link is right there on the screen. Actually, it's not a link. It's just my name, <laughs> my Twitter name. Uh, I'm going to check because I think that I had everything set up so that notifications get sent directly to Twitter when I go live. So I'll check that out too. Um, I hope that everyone had a really great time today. I know I did. Um, and I guess that I will see you, if not later today. Yeah, thanks for being here, JSA. Um, if I don't see you later today, because I'm still not sure if I'm going to do some Minecraft later, then I will see you hopefully on Thursday at 1 p.m. Uh, Pacific Standard Time or next Monday at noon Pacific Standard Time, which are my regular stream days. Um, I guess that's all for now. <laughs> Thank you, Teach. Yeah, you're welcome. Um, let's see if there is somewhere else for us to go. Um, oof. <laughs> Oof, I'm not really seeing anything. Hold on. Oh, I don't know if you heard that, but that was totally my stomach. Yeah, there's no one else that's live. So we're just going to call it uh, for today. Unless you guys want to go check out Slice Lime, who is playing Minecraft. Uh, he is also one of the developers of the game. I can send you over there if you want to, but... Anyways, what... Anyways all right. I will see you guys later. Thanks for being here. Make sure to follow. Peace.